We're coming now to the very end of Great and Holy Lent. And we just celebrated the services for St. Mary of Egypt. The fifth Sunday of Lent was dedicated to St. Mary, who was one of the great saints of the Church, one of the foremost of the ascetic saints of the Church. When I say ascetic saints, I mean the saints whose lives were focused on prayer, whose lives were focused on fasting, whose lives were focused on repentance. St. Mary is really one of the saints who is at the pinnacle of that kind of way of life. And it's interesting if you look at the reading that we have for St. Mary of Egypt Sunday, how closely it matches up with her life. And you might think that that shouldn't be surprising because you would think, well, probably the people who decided what reading we would have for this week chose it to match St. Mary of Egypt, but that's not the case, actually. The readings for the Sundays of Lent were set very early on, and it wasn't until later that those Sundays were dedicated to the saints that they're dedicated to today. So it wasn't until well after the Gospel reading for the fifth Sunday of Lent had been set that the commemoration of St. Mary of Egypt was set. The same is true earlier in Lent of St. Gregory Paul Moss and St. John Thymicus. The Gospel readings for those weeks were set before the commemoration of those saints. And yet we see that through God's providence, there are still parallels between the lives of those saints and what we read about in the Gospel readings. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about St. Mary of Egypt, and I would encourage all of you, as I've been saying throughout this past week, to look up her life, to read about her. You can find it, and I'll send out a link to her, to her life so you can read about it. But St. Mary was a person who, for the beginning portion of her life, lived in a way that was not the way we're supposed to live. She lived a very sinful life at first, a life that was not pleasing to God. St. Mary was at first a prostitute. She lived in a large city, and she enjoyed her way of life. She had no desire to change. And then one day, she saw that many people were going toward the docks, and many people were getting onto a boat. And St. Mary was a person who always loved being with crowds. She loved being wherever the people were gathered. So when she saw these people all going to the boats, going to the docks, she asked them and said, Where is it that you're going, all of you at once? And they answered her, We're going to Jerusalem, because Holy Week is starting, and we want to be able to celebrate the events, to commemorate the events of Christ's crucifixion, his passion, his death, and his resurrection. We want to celebrate those feasts in the place where they actually happen, in the holy city of Jerusalem. And so St. Mary didn't know anything about the Christian faith, but she thought, well, it looks like lots of people are going to Jerusalem, and I like being where the crowds are. So she got on the boat, and she even plied her trade on the boat. She even did what her career was, that I mentioned earlier, on that boat with these pilgrims as they were going to Jerusalem. We think we're hypocrites today, but look at that. And she gets to Jerusalem with the other pilgrims, and she spends many days going around the city, just seeing what's what, exploring. And finally, the day when we commemorate Christ's crucifixion came. Holy Friday came. And St. Mary saw all of the pilgrims making their way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Why? Because at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they had a relic of the true cross. They had some of the wood from the true cross. And so they were celebrating the services of Holy Friday with a special importance there in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And St. Mary, of course, wanted to be where the crowds were, so she followed the crowds to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But when she got there, something happened to her that she could not understand. She found that she could not enter the church. Everyone else was coming in, no issues. But when she tried to enter the church of the Holy Sepulchre, she wasn't able to. It was as if something was resisting her and not letting her enter the church. And so after trying several times in a row, she became frustrated, she became discouraged. She walked a little, a little ways away from the entrance, and she saw hanging on the outside of the church of the Holy Sepulchre 
an icon of the Panagia, an icon of the Virgin Mary. And she said to her, I don't understand why is it that I'm not able to enter the church. And, and the Theotokos spoke to her and said, you're not able to enter the church because you're not worthy to venerate the wood of the cross. You are not worthy to worship Christ hanging on the cross along with these other pilgrims. Your sins have made you unworthy to enter the church. And St. Mary is very upset to hear this. And she's moved in her heart and she's pained because of her sins. And she looks at everything she's done in the past and she realizes that she's been living a way of life that is not pleasing to God. And she repents. And she bows down and she asks for God's forgiveness for her sins. Now we're going to pause talking about St. Mary and come back to the life of St. Mary. We need to talk for a minute about the Gospel reading that we have for this Sunday. In the Gospel reading for this Sunday, Jesus is telling the Apostles about his crucifixion. He's telling them about everything that's about to happen that he will be hung on the cross, that he will die and be buried, and he will rise on the third day. And then two of the apostles come up to him in private, and they do something very interesting. They try to get God to show favoritism to them. They try to get Jesus to show partiality to them. They say, Jesus, we're good friends. You know that we are two very important people, important apostles. We want to ask you for a favor. And Jesus looks at them and says, what is it that you want? And they say, this is the favor we want to ask for you. When you come into your kingdom, we want to be the ones who are seated to the right hand and the left hand of your throne. Just that, very small little favor. Just give us that place of importance. In your kingdom. But God is not the kind of person who shows favoritism. And if you look at the New Testament, you'll see many times throughout the New Testament where it talks about God not showing partiality. God is not the kind of person who plays favorites, who picks this person over this other person. If you were to read in the book of Acts, you would see that when the Apostle Peter sees that Jesus is allowing the Gentiles to come into the church. He's astounded by this, and Peter says, Truly I see that there is no partiality with God, but in any nation, whoever fears him and does what is just in his sight is acceptable to him. There is no partiality with God, Peter said. And if you look at that word, for partiality, in the original Greek, it has an interesting meaning. Because the word means, literally, if you were to look at the roots of that word, it means to lift someone's face up from the ground. What does that mean? How, why would that mean partiality? That then, if you had a request to make of the king, you would come to the king, and you would bow down before him in a prostration, with your face to the ground and you would make your request to him. And the king, kings back then were definitely the kinds of people who did show partiality. So the king is seeing this person coming to him and making a request of him. And the king is going to think, okay, who is this person? Is this a family member of mine? Is this a friend of mine? Is this a person with wealth? A person with power? Is this a person who I might want to make a political alliance with some kind? And if the king, after thinking about those things, decided, okay, I want to grant this person their request, then he would go down to them and he would lift their face up from the ground. He would raise them up from their prostration and he would grant them their request. In other words, the king would grant their request not on the basis of the humility that the person is showing by coming before them and bowing down to the ground. But the king would grant that request or not based on things they already knew about this person. 
based on in the back of their head how they wanted to treat this person, given what they already know about them. But God is not the kind of person who thinks about our past when he sees us coming before him in humility and bowing down to him. In the book of James in the New Testament, the Apostle James says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. In other words, just like the king, God is going to raise us up from our humility. God raises us up. He takes us by the hand and raises us up from the depths. But he does that not because of something he already knows about us from the past, but he does that when we come before him in humility, in faith, and repentance. He sees the humility and the repentance that is in our hearts, and he responds with his mercy because of that humility, because of that repentance. And so now we can turn back to the life of St. Mary. And we'll see that if God had been the sort of person to play favorites, if God had shown partiality, if God had been like the kings who give you your request based on what they already know about you from your past, or if they know that you're not somebody that they want to associate with, then they don't bring a request. If that had been the sort of person that God is, he probably would not have been merciful to St. Mary. Because everything from St. Mary's past would not have put her on God's nice list. She would not have been one of God's favorites if God was thinking just in terms of what she had done in the past. But luckily for St. Mary, and luckily for us, that's not the kind of God we worship. Because God looks at St. Mary in her repentance, in her sorrow, in her humiliation over her sins. And he answers her by showing mercy on her. He raises her up from her humility, from her depths. And she is able finally to go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to venerate the wood of the cross and to worship the true God. And after that experience, what she did is she went out into the desert. She went first to the monastery that's on the banks of the River Jordan. And there she was baptized and received communion for the first time. And she goes across the River Jordan and she goes out in the desert. And for 47 years of her life, she is in the desert alone, praying to God, mourning for her sins, and living out her repentance. Why does she do that? Because repentance is not a one-time thing that happens, we, we say a little prayer, and then we're done and we're good. That's not the way repentance works. Repentance is something that we have to renew in our heart every day. Repentance is something that we have to add to the fires of repentance in our heart, or else it goes cold. We have to keep shoveling the coals of our prayer into our heart, or our repentance dies out. Repentance is growing, growing closer to God every day. Repentance always means believing in our heart that tomorrow we can do better than we did today. And so repentance happens over the days, over the weeks, over the months, and over the years, not just in an instant. And St. Mary spent the 47 years of her life alone until finally a monk, a priest, named Father Zosima, who now is St. Zosima, finds her there in the desert. Because the monks from the monastery at, Saint, uh, at, at, um, at the Jordan River had a tradition which I talked about earlier in Lent, where when Lent started, all the monks would go out into the desert to struggle in their prayer alone by themselves for those 40 days in the desert. And St. Zosima found St. Mary out in the desert because God wanted to reveal to us something about her life and about her repentance. God wanted to show her to us as an example because that repentance that she had is the same repentance that we also can have. 
when we look at the lives of saints like St. Mary, we tend to think to ourselves, okay, that's, a, that's nice, but that's not possible today, and that's not possible for me. And that's not true. God showed us St. Mary as an example to show us that it is possible. And there are people, even today, who live the same kind of life as St. Mary, who live lives of deep, deep repentance and prayer. And God doesn't necessarily make them all known to us. Many of them live in seclusion for their whole life, deeply in prayer. But God showed us St. Mary to show us that that way of life is possible. And even for those of us who we can't leave behind everything that we have here in the world, can't leave our jobs to just go out into the woods or over the desert to pray, nonetheless, we can have that same repentance in our heart, that same prayer in our heart. Because God responded to St. Mary's humility and to her repentance by giving her mercy. And now I want to say, since God does not play favorites, since God does not show partiality, we are also called not to play favorites. We know in our lives that often we treat one person differently from another. We treat people who are family members or friends differently from people who are strangers. We treat people who we know have nothing to offer us differently from people who maybe we want to ask a favor for. We treat those people differently. Or maybe even in the church, we tend to treat people who are members of our community here differently from people who are members of a community somewhere else. But God has called us to something greater than that, something, something better than that. God calls us to react to each person in front of us by looking at their needs, by looking at their heart, by reacting with them with Christian love. And Christian love is love that is indiscriminate. Christian love responds to the unique needs and situation of the person who is in front of us. Christian love is not looking at the past, but looking at the person who is in front of us, who has come to us in humility and responding to their needs. And that's the kind of love that I want to call each of you to today. Love that doesn't think about, about how connected is this person, is this person a family member, is this a friend, but love that reaches out to all the world and responds to the needs that we see in front of us. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening. May God bless you. And may the Holy Trinity protect you. Amen.